Well, good afternoon. My name is Mark Wu. I'm the director of the Fairbank Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the next installment of our Critical Issues Confronting China series. This is a series uh, started uh, by the late Professor Ezra Vogel, um, along with uh, Professor uh, William Shao and uh, Bill Overholt uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, we have the pleasure today of welcoming uh, Professor Mishin Pei. Uh, I think he may not need an introduction uh, for many of you, uh, but I will just do a short one uh, out of courtesy. Uh, professor Pei is the Pritzker Professor of Government uh, at Claremont McKay College in California. Uh, he also, until recently, served as the chair of the government department there, and he earned uh, the Presidential uh, Award of Merit uh, from uh, Clara McKenna. Um, he is also well known to many of you as the editor-in-chief of the China Leadership Monitor. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar uh, about it, this is one of the key tools uh, that we have available to us uh, to have updates about those uh, within China's leadership structure. Uh, he is the author of several well-known books. Uh, one of those is uh, one entitled uh, China's Crony Capitalism, The Dynamics of Regime Decay. Uh, this was a book that came out over seven years ago. Uh, some of you may be saying, well, the regime has not quite decayed yet, or perhaps the dynamics are playing out slower than we may have thought. Um, so Professor Pei has a new book coming out uh, shortly called The Sentinel State. And this uh, is a, uh, the basis of his lecture here today, uh, but touching on why this regime uh, is using surveillance mechanisms in its current state uh, to discuss um, how it's preserving its tenuous hold on power. So I think we're in for a real treat today. Um, it is uh, also our pleasure to call Professor Pei one of our own. Uh, he is a graduate of our master's program uh, where he was here uh, during uh, the spring of 1989. Uh, and then he stayed on to earn a PhD uh, in political science here in 1991. Um, so he certainly is a proud legacy of those who've come out from the Harvard uh, government department and those who've gone on uh, to forge illustrious careers uh, in China studies. So Professor Pei, welcome back to your alma mater. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this uh, uh, very warm introduction. It's very happy to be back home. Um, I uh, have uh, very fond memories of my years here. Uh, that's 30 years ago, it's hard, more than 30 years ago. So it's hard to, uh, uh, it, uh, well, a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, a lot of friends who were my mentors, friends, are not teaching here anymore. Uh, but uh, the institution stays. Uh, Today I want to share with you uh, the research I've done for the last seven years on China's surveillance state, the surveillance system. If you look at the media, there's a lot of coverage on this system, but the media coverage, as we know, uh, uh, is incomplete. Uh, for several reasons, the media tends to chase what is fashionable, and what is fashionable in China today is the technology part. That is uh, facial recognition, uh, AI, uh, sensors that tend to get a lot of attention. But as social scientists, we're much more interested in the entire system because a surveillance system encompasses not just the use of technology, but a lot of organization, a lot of technical uh, adjustments, refinements, uh, what have you. So the book. Uh, that I uh, uh, have uh, published, and then the, so this is based on the book, uh, uh, gives you, uh, I would say, a sort of very basic understanding of how the system is organized. And it also uh, allows us uh, to uh, establish some uh, parameters of the system. Uh, and uh, I have to say that. Uh, even though I've spent six years uh, collecting data, uh, it's very difficult to collect information on the surveillance system because much of this is actually classified. So I'll explain to you how I uh, was able to get uh, hold of uh, uh, these materials. Uh, so let's just uh, ch charge ahead. Uh, the theoretical uh, 
piece of this scholarship is actually fairly straightforward. It's all about repression. That authoritarian regimes we know have to use violence to deter, to suppress opposition into, uh, uh, in order to st stay in power. But there were two kinds of repression. One is uh, sort of ex ante hard repression, uh, ex ante uh, exposed repression, reactive repression. Uh, that is sort of a, uh, this is Tiananmen Square, uh, 19, May 1989. We all uh, remember those days. Um, and this is June 4th, uh, 1989. Uh, this kind of, this happened, uh, and as a result, the Chinese Communist Party had to use massive force. It is very costly. Uh, this is reactive re repression. And uh, after Tiananmen, the Chinese government learned its lesson, and it began to develop, refine, modernize a system of preventive repression. And so prevent, uh, Preventive repression involves surveillance, but there are sort of three crucial challenges to any authoritarian regime that wants to use preventive repression to stay in power. The first challenge is, the so, is a familiar sort of coercive dilemma. If you want to use repression, so reactive or preventive, you have to empower a very large a very powerful secret police agency. The challenge is how do you avoid giving the police agency too much power and make, and make the uh, police agency your own threat. Of course, you need a powerful police agency in order to prevent the opposition from becoming a real threat. So this is a political challenge. The second challenge is, again, also very familiar. That is, most dictatorships rule low to middle income countries. And that means resource constraint. <coughs> the amount of manpower you use, the kind of technology uh, you have, uh, and that uh, means poor countries, low in, uh, so middle income countries will be inherently limited in deploying uh, the amount of manpower and technology they have. So the third is operational challenges. How do you make the system you have operating effectively in terms of uh, tech, uh, technical sophistication, uh, in terms of coverage uh, uh, and coordination? Because uh, surveillance is not just done by one police agency. It's, it's done by many actors, either directly related to state or indirect, indirectly related to state. So these, the, uh, the research, uh, I've done uh, revolves around three issues. I want to show how the Chinese Communist Party sequentially, successfully, or effectively addressed these three challenges. Uh, OK, so uh, the outline is I will first sort of, uh, provide some historical background to show that uh, as soon as the Communist Party uh, seized power, uh, in 1949, it began to build the foundations of a uh, surveillance state. The, f uh, the frameworks, the institutional organizational frameworks are still here today. And then we sort of uh, map this system, look at its organization, uh, uh, the role played by informants, uh, the scope of uh, the surveillance, uh, mainly what kind of people, the percentage of the population covered, and finally the use of technology. Uh, now, let's, uh, let me say a few uh, words about sources. It is really difficult to get hold of the, uh, uh, these sources. Uh, uh, it's impossible to go to China and uh, interview a secret uh, policeman and say, tell me how you do your business. Uh, uh, you run enormous risks. Uh, 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 the Chinese system has leakages. Uh, the, uh, China has three, nearly 3,000 county level jurisdictions, 300 city level jurisdictions, and 30 plus provincial level jurisdictions. They all publish annual reports. They are called uh, sort of a nianjian. Uh, they are brief summaries. Uh, the amount of information you can get is uneven. Certain jurisdictions do a much less 
good job in the eyes of the government in terms of controlling the amount of sensitive information released. So you can actually get a lot out of uh, this. Uh, half of the data uh, from the book comes from local yearbooks. The other uh, uh, really important source of information, and I'm sure the Fairbank Center Library has those, is local police gazettes. Uh, uh, in the 1990s and the first decade of this century, the Chinese government tried to reconstruct its local history. So they uh, asked local governments, local departments, to publish gazettes. Basically, these are local histories. So the police gazettes are really useful. Uh, of course, the degree of usefulness varies. Uh, some would just give you very detailed information on um, uh, tactics, uh, the use of spies. Uh, so that's one. And uh, the other uh, source, uh, well, uh, incidentally, uh, that, that is, this is a, a sort of Xinjiang police gazette. This is uh, the Xinjiang police yearbooks. So police department also pu publish yearbooks. And uh, universities publish yearbooks. And the la uh, another source that I find really interesting because there are a lot of terminologies used. So how do you understand the police terminologies? Lo and behold, they publish uh, police textbooks uh, in police academies because they train police. So you can find these so police uh, textbooks and they really help you because textbooks tell you how to recruit informants. And finally, if you, if uh, anybody here wants to write a history of Chinese policing, this is a very useful uh, uh, resource. Uh, in 2000, uh, the Chinese government published uh, main events uh, in the chronology of Chinese public security. And I'm sure there's a copy somewhere in the Fairbank Center. Okay. So these are the sources. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, I rely on official data in terms of restructuring, res uh, constructing uh, the basic architecture of uh, China's surveillance state. So the evolution of the state, uh, surveillance state, uh, this is the, the historical part. As soon as the Chinese Communist Party seized power, uh, it began a very systematic way of establishing a system of social control. Uh, one piece is that uh, it uh, uh, conducted a very brutal, uh, violent campaign that not only physically liquidated millions of enemies, but the campaign also identified uh, uh, 200, uh, 20 million, 50 million uh, uh, sort of class enemies that would be uh, uh, targets of surveillance, and the party also mobilized uh, millions of party activists, in, uh, uh, local activists, to su uh, supplement the party, the, the, the new state's very meager policing resources. So most of the, uh, uh, so uh, there comes the network of spies. There's a very good book uh, uh, on that period called Spying for the People, published by somebody who used to be a researcher here, uh, 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 Shonghaus. And uh, then it also developed a very rudimentary uh, text, uh, sort of a leading group, the party's uh, bu in internal bureaucracy. And uh, one of the first things the party did, the regime did, was to establish the domestic secret police. About the domestic secret police, was, uh, I'll say, a bit more later on, but if you look at sort of the, these uh, sort of uh, elements, most of them uh, are still in existence today. Uh, and so targets, what kind of surveillance program do they have? The most important uh, is this program, the so-called four category elements. These are mostly class enemies, old regime landlords, we're talking about uh, uh, most of the people, between half to three quarters of uh, people in this category are landlords or rich peasants. In other words, this is class-based designation. And uh, the government released this uh, sort of aggregate data that over the law uh, in the Maoist period, roughly 20 million 
people were in this program. The challenge uh, for a scholar is that this, uh, 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 this number actually does not mean much because these people sort of, uh, sort of are labeled or sort of delabeled all the time. So what would be the percentage of the population? So I dug up a lot of local data and the, uh, so based on local data, I don't think the central government actually has good data. So basically, we're talking about roughly 1.5%. So it's a relatively small uh, percentage of population uh, that was sort of in this program. Just, if you're in this program, if you're labeled four category elements, you lose your civil liberties. You uh, are often forced to do hard labor. Uh, uh, the only difference between somebody in this program and somebody in a prison is that they're not in prison. Uh, but otherwise, they, uh, 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 their uh, personal freedom and civil liberties uh, uh, were deprived. And also during the Maoist period, the institute, this program, which uh, I will talk about later on, is called Key Populations, uh, which is a police-run program to monitor uh, sus uh, suspects in uh, Chinese society. But the Maoist period was a very mixed period. On the one hand, the party did succeed in establishing this uh, quite robust and enduring framework. But the Mao, Mao, in the Maoist period, the Mao, uh, uh, Maoist radicalism turned out to be the worst enemy of an institutionalized surveillance state because he made two, uh, uh, his rule was known for two meg mega disasters. One was the Great Leap Forward, and mainly an economic disaster after which uh, lack of resources forced the government to uh, 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 cut down investments and resources available for the surveillance state. We uh, will see this in the police uh, data. The other was the Cultural Revolution, a, poli a political di disaster uh, which uh, in the first few years really devastated the surveillance network. According to Schoenhaus and according to the chronology, in 1967, they dismantled the entire network of informants. Just, so between 67 and 74, there were no informants in Chinese uh, society uh, because those, were, uh, those informants were connected with the old public security bureaucracy. During the, the 1980s was really interesting because there was this big puzzle. How could something like Tiananmen happen? Uh, did the secret police, the informant networks, sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, taking a big nap, right, so, so to speak? Uh, my uh, sort of reading is, my analysis, uh, again, it's sub subject to interpretation, is that the 1980s, the government still, uh, the Chinese uh, party state was still recovering from the shocks of the Cultural Revolution. The country was relatively poor. It did not have the resources to build a, a sort of a, a robust surveillance system. So it was a recovery period in terms of uh, the surveillance institutions. Second, reformers were in charge. Zhao, uh, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, you know, they were at the, sort of the top of the government. So probably they did not have strong incentives to ask the uh, law enforcement to crack down um, uh, uh, civil society or political <coughs> dissent. And so there's a very important development in the 1980s that Deng Xiaoping himself was obsessed with crime. So he launched a series of yan da, strike hard uh, uh, campaigns which uh, uh, netted, which uh, sort of arrested, incarcerated a lot of uh, sort of, uh, quote unquote, criminals. One thing about the Chinese surveillance system is that if you are arrested and released from prison, you become a known target. So this, so the police uh, has to assign people to to watch you. So that is a diversion of uh, resources. Uh, what has changed is really after 1989. So if those of us who want to uh, have a strong appreciation of the historical turning point that 1989 is a histor historical turning point. You can see this uh, instantly in how the Chinese Communist Party uh, 
so recovering or just surviving that experience, decided to invest in a modern surveillance system on a massive scale afterwards. So that's brief uh, history. So this is, uh, so if we can find some kind of proxy of the resources available to the Chinese government, police, uh, so this is uniform police. Uh, the figure probably can tell us a lot because a sizable share of this police force is domestic secret, secret police. Uh, uh, incidentally, this data today is classified. You, uh, you cannot get the up to date, uh, but occasionally they would release. So uh, you can see that in the mid 1980s, uh, was relatively few. 1989, because they did not break sort of a breakout date mid, so June 89 or December 1989, you saw some uh, increase, but the real sort of great leap forward, uh, we're talking about the two decades after Tiananmen, basically the police force almost tripled in size, so that's one. And uh, for locals, so, well, so these the, uh, data from these two Zhejiang counties, but Zhejiang is a province that published the most detailed police gazettes. Uh, so you can get uh, some, so you can see the, the, the 60s, they just, the police force was sad, was sort of really wrecked by both the cultural, of, so this is uh, by the Great Leap Forward. And it did not really recover in the 1970s. And the real recovery, this is 1990s, because we, we only have one date you had just huge difference between 1980s and 1990s. So this is just one uh, uh, sort of data point. Another data point which is more sort of readily available is the domestic security budget, which funds the police, among the courts, prisons, uh, uh, prosecutors, and police. Uh, you can see that 1991, only 10 billion yuan, which is peanuts, right? Today, we're talking about 1.1 trillion yuan. So adjusted for information in the last 30 years, China's uh, investments or resources available for domestic security uh, have increased by 24 times in real terms. So this is massive increase. Uh, uh, so there are uh, these features uh, uh, of the sort of a Chinese surveillance state. One is that China has a very innovative uh, model of surveillance, uh, designed mainly to uh, accomplish two objectives. One is to uh, address the coercive dilemma. You don't want to sort of fo uh, concentrate all the capabilities in one se uh, security bureaucracy. The other is to ensure wider coverage. That is, you want to cover as uh, the many corners of society as possible. So I call this the distributed surveillance. That is the task of keeping an eye on potential suspects is distributed uh, among different bureaucracies, even among uh, organizations that are normally uh, not part of a security establishment. For example, universities. Uh, we're speaking at sort of Harvard. But in China, universities have their security departments, party uh, branches, and these universities in China uh, uh, actually perform surveillance functions. So that they uh, recruit informants, mm -hmm. they collect information, they report them uh, to uh, law enforcement authorities. So that is so. This is the one. So, uh, the second one is that it has a, it is really so top down. Uh, coordination, so sort of, uh, typical of a Leninist system. What makes the Chinese system different and quite, again, innovative is that because of the nature of distributed surveillance, you need a specialized party bureaucracy to coordinate different actors. Otherwise, this will be a very messy, disorganized system. So the Chinese uh, in the Chinese system, uh, there is this agency called the Political Legal Affairs Committee, uh, which uh, did not exist in the former Soviet bloc. Uh, I sort of compared the East German system, 
uh, supposedly the gold standard, if there's such a thing, for state surveillance, Stasi, KGB, they did not have a top-down system. Just to show how important this bureaucracy is, China, the Communist Party only has five specialized party bureaucracies from the very top to the very bottom, and this is one of those. So this is uh, 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 top-down uh, sort of coordination. And the third what I call the lean and mean, that is, it's formal security agencies responsible for domestic spying are actually very small. That is a surprise. Uh, we, uh, so, uh, Stasi, that, uh, Stasi is, all, is a good sort of, uh, sort of reference point uh, because Stasi uh, is seen as one of the most capable, well-organized uh, secret service in the communist state. Stasi, by the time it, uh, so, uh, it disappeared in uh, 1989. Stasi equivalent to a thousand pop people in East Germany. Six would be Stasi employees. So if you use this, of course, this is both for domestic spying and external espionage. If you use this ratio for China, the Chinese MSS plus the first department of the Ministry of Public security, this is the sort of domestic secret police. These two agencies, well, one department and one agency alone would be 8.4 million people. That's obviously ridiculous, right? This, this is a ridiculous number. Uh, so that means the Chinese, the formal system is relatively small. Uh, and another thing that sort of, uh, marks the Chinese system as quite unique is that the system has developed, I'm not saying that from the very beginning it had a good sort of playbook to uh, uh, work with. Uh, over time, it developed a set of proven effective uh, tactics in terms of survey, uh, sort of keeping eyes on uh, uh, important targets. So this is the sort of a, the summary of the Chinese surveillance state. Let me just now go into its individual parts. This is the formal uh, uh, system. Uh, so I mentioned this special bureaucracy, uh, part, uh, the party's political legal committee, Zheng uh, Fawei. What's interesting about this committee is that it became fully staffed, well resourced, and gained power only after the Tiananmen period. Before the Tiananmen period, you would have uh, one person do, doing basically a part time job in a county. Now, every county, we're talking about average 10, 20 people. So they, it's, a, uh, it's a sizable bureaucracy. So you look at uh, top down, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of people just working in that bureaucracy uh, uh, alone. So, and uh, uh, then it, uh, there was a local yearbook called Zheng Fan Yan Jian, if you want to write about, uh, do research on this uh, bureaucracy. So it's, it's really interesting when you go through their annual reports or uh, what kind of things they do, uh, uh, you have to be impressed that it is very methodical. Uh, everything happens on a schedule. January, the Central Committee, uh, Central Legal, Political Legal Committee will, will meet and then they will lay out the security agenda. Then the province, uh, uh, three weeks later or a month later, the Provincial Committee would meet. So within three months, the lowest level of the Chinese state would have very clear uh, signals or instructions on the priorities. And this committee also do, uh, does its research uh, on uh, surveillance tactics or uh, 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 so domestic uh, security uh, uh, policy issues. And uh, during, uh, when, uh, we know that Ch China steps up uh, security during so-called sensitive periods. So next week, the, the Lianghui, the two sessions will happen in China, and this committee will be completely mobilized to ensure that extra security steps are uh, uh, followed. Uh, so this is about this committee. What's interesting is this man. Uh, usually, the head of this committee is the retired uh, is the former domestic police chief. He is the former secret police chief, MSS. So this is the first time uh, 
a man with an external espionage background is put in that uh, position. Um, now, the formal security agency, uh, we have uh, sort of a really three branches in the uh, Chinese law enforcement. Uh, the Ministry of Public Security is the most powerful branch. Even though I think the Ministry of State Security has this mystique of being elite, of being uh, really effective. In terms of domestic spying, most of the, uh, sort of, uh, the responsibilities fall on this uh, unit called the domestic, uh, now it's called political security protection, it used to be called domestic security protection, Based, we don't know how many people work there. So based on local data, we don't have a lot. Uh, my estimate is it's actually relatively small, so three to five percent. Uh, what's uh, so uh, uh, interesting about the Chinese system is that it's very similar to the American system. Okay? It's dissimilar to the Stasi, to the KGB model. The Stasi and KGB model combines domestic spying with external espionage. And that makes Stasi and KGB really powerful. China does not want to go down that path. Even though, interestingly, uh, when China uh, was, the People's Republic was founded, the Soviet experts came and helped them build their security apparatus. Apparently, they ignored the Soviet advice in terms of combining domestic spying and external espionage. So this, this is. Uh, very small, and uh, uh, it, uh, it focuses on priority targets. The second police unit uh, is the police stations. Normally, police stations in China, these are big cops. We think they are in charge of routine law enforcement uh, functions, but they also uh, perform some surveillance function, mostly in terms of law enforcement, but also uh, they recruit uh, informants. And so Ministry of State Security, uh, we don't know how big it is uh, because it's really uh, sort of shrouded in secrecy. Uh, what I found in sort of looking through their annual reports, incidentally, after uh, uh, so at the beginning of this century, they stopped publishing uh, uh, annual yearbooks. Oh, uh, year yearbooks in local governments uh, do not contain anything about MSS. So, this is dated. But what's interesting about this agency is that it is really active on uh, university campuses. And it has, I think, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to sort of stick my reputation on this. I think it has, it has exclusive responsibility in ethnic minority areas. Because I do not see the other agency active in ethnic minority areas. The reason is quite simple, because the Chinese government believes that problems in Tibet and Xinjiang are the uh, works of uh, external hostile forces. So this agency is much better equipped. Uh, in terms of domestic spying, this agency has very limited uh, remit. That is, uh, it spies, uh, it keeps its eyes only on individuals suspected of foreign connections. Uh, now, the, the, the most exciting part, because uh, uh, people who sort of uh, uh, news coverage of the book always mention this time, the backbone of the Chinese system is not the secret police. Of secret police mostly sort of uh, runs these people. It is the network of spies. Uh, the estimating network of spies is really hard, uh, especially the sort of uh, the ones run by the police, because. Uh, the police just does not tell you how many uh, informants they, uh, uh, they hire. Uh, what is sort of a, uh, uh, useful for us to uh, know is that they have several categories. Uh, two main categories. One is so run by uh, the, the uh, uh, criminal investigation units in law enforcement and, seek, uh, and the sort of poli political police. Uh, they are called the uh, special intelligence personnel. Uh, what we know about these people is that uh, turnover is pretty high, like two to three years. You, uh, you're useful only for a particular purpose, in other words. And the other uh, thing 
to know is that they recruit three types of these elite police informants to think they actually get paid. Okay. Uh, so they have three categories. They are basically assigned three responsibilities. One is called case spies. That is, if they suspect, say, Mark, for example, Mark is dissident. So they will try to recruit somebody who knows Mark, who can gain access to Mark family office, uh, and that person will be responsible for providing intelligence on somebody like Mark. So that's only a small percentage, like ten percent. Okay. Uh, uh, that's because dissident activities in China actually are not that numerous. So uh, uh, one thing about so what kind of sort of underground churches, uh, uh, cult organizations, these are all infiltration uh, sort of targets. Then about 40%, uh, they're called position control spies. That is, they have responsibility over a given venue, Fairbank Center, equivalent in China. They think this is a hotbed for dissent. So they will re recruit somebody uh, in the Fairbank Center to be the sort of position control informant. And the third is generic. So we're talking about 50% of their uh, uh, informants are sort of generic spies. That is, they, uh, uh, they get approached uh, regularly to ask whether they've heard anything from the, uh, uh, that was reporting. This is from one source. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of other sort of sources. This is from Shanxi data. Then the uh, local police, they run sort of uh, uh, that is public order informants. Uh, and uh, so they, mostly they, these are recruited for public safety uh, duties. So what kind of ideal recruits? Uh, you go through these yearbooks and they actually tell you uh, they like taxi. Drivers. So go to China. Don't think that taxi drivers are sort of a safe source of information. Okay. Uh, makes sense because they know where people are coming and going. They can report. They also like delivery men who can gain access, uh, who can report where somebody is at home. They like uh, sanitation workers you know, because they actually in public uh, sort of uh, places they see a lot of goings on. So there's sort of, sort of uh, 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 in other words. Uh, these people know uh, whom to uh, recruit. Uh, so n number of touching, so how do we estimate? It's a, uh, there are only two ways, because this is a very sort of a, sort of a, secret, uh, uh, sort of a secrecy shrouded data. That is, if you use a Sanxi data, this is actually sort of my, uh, the book I uh, uh, used. That roughly four per 10,000, in that case, sort of, uh, uh, Half a million, right? And then they, uh, the police data, because I've come across a lot of references to a quota system. Each beat cop has to recruit two ears and eyes for the, uh, per year. So that on a yearly basis, that is sort of 800,000 if you use some kind of rough estimates. So I think the police alone probably run uh, more than a million on an annual uh, basis. Uh, so now this category we know a lot more. It's called Xin Xuan. This is much less elite uh, information about this group, uh, much more readily available. You can actually see this sort of a, a job ad, uh, recruiting somebody younger than 70. So I guess I'm still eligible, healthy, <laughs> sort of loyalty to the party, and aware, sort of familiar with the people in the neighborhood. So check all the boxes. So this, again, uh, based on 30, so yearbooks are really helpful because I suspect the number of recruits is some kind of ma uh, uh, so metric for showing your effectiveness. So some lo localities would report that so this year they recruit. I only look at new recruits. I do not look at some. So in other words, so then, you check, so compare the number with their population. So this category, we're talking about roughly 10 to 15, 16 million people in this category. Uh, and, uh, but what's interesting about this group is that the number on the books is one thing, but 
how effective they are. That is a sort of puzzle. You can sort of theoretically have a lot of people agreeing to spy for the government, but at the same time, they actually don't spy. So, so in the case of China, that is roughly uh, some jurisdictions, they actually tell you how many spies, so how many informants they have, how many pieces of intelligence the informants provide. So if you look, compare, if you look at these jurisdictions, what you find is that 60% actually do not provide any information. So how do you explain this discrepancy? This is my theory. Of course, it needs to be verified. First, I think it is very hard. It is, you, you run a much bigger risk if a local official comes to you and say, would you like to be an informant? If you turn him down, there are consequences. So people would sign up. And for the local official, if you sign up people, then you hit some kind of target. But providing information, there is no hard quota because that is dynamic. No, Nobody knows. Probably the more information you provide, the, be the worse the lo local official looks because it means sort of less stable. So for the person who has agreed to spy, but is really very reluctant to spy for the government, he simply says, well, I, I really don't know anything that's worth reporting. So that might, and if you agree to spy but do not actually provide information, that's much less risk. So I think this is the dynamic that is going on. But does this mean that the system is not effective? I think it's still quite effective because people know that their neighbors, their coworkers might be informants. And so that has a powerful deterrent effect. So what kind of things they actually report, we, again, based on local data work, we know is that most of the stuff does not deal with the so-called enemy intel. There are three kinds of intelligence the Chinese police collects. One is classified as enemy intelligence. That is, intelligence that has to do with terrorists, dissidents, underground religious activities, cults. That's hard, most valuable. But only 3%. Uh, my interpretation is that A, uh, dissident activities are not actually as frequent as most people believe. And B, this network might actually not be accessible to, might not have access to the targets, so that's one. But most of the intelligence deals with sort of a political intelligence. Political intelligence is this category about what people think about the government, government policies. Social intelligence, so society intelligence, uh, is a category that deals with what are the hot topics, inflation, housing prices, unemployment. So in other words, I think this might give us an indication that the Chinese government, the Communist Party leadership, is not exactly out of touch because they don't have free press, so that's limited. But they have this vast network, 10 million plus people, who can tell them what is going on. So there has to be some kind of mechanism of aggregating uh, that. Uh, so, uh, and as, uh, so in terms of the quality of uh, intelligence, 75% uh, probably junk. That's not worth reporting because one metric I use is that if they report a piece of intelligence to a superior authority, that is probably an indication of its quality. So uh, there, you, there you go. Okay, so let me just, so scope of intelligence. That is uh, uh, an, in, uh, a surveillance state must have this component. This is very sort of classified. Uh, there are two organized programs. One is organized by the police called key populations. This is a screenshot of what kind of information they collect. And uh, based on my data, it's roughly sort of a, uh, three uh, people in a thousand. So this is five million. This is not the biggest program. And most people in this program are uh, ex-comics. They know. The, uh, so this is a much less, say, political surveillance program than this one. This is the key individuals program, two separate programs. There might be overlap, but 
based on local data, local data governments would report. This year we have this many key people in key populations, this many people in key individuals. So they have to be sort of distinct. So based on local data, this is a much bigger program and much more uh, politicized, a political program, because uh, uh, A, it's not designated by the police. This program follows a very strict procedure, very labor-intensive, administrative, uh, 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 labor-intensive. This is much less so because local authorities have a lot of leeway in designating people. In other words, this is actually reminds me of the four categories program <laughs> uh, that is uh, uh, you can. And this one, a very large, we don't have enough data to show the sheer uh, of people, so what kind of people are in this program. But based on references, ethnic minorities, former PLX soldiers, because they are very good at organizing. Uh, this is, uh, if you read Chinese, this is a sort of a, a notice on this particular sort of Se Jun Ren Yuan, so a former PLA, official, uh, PL, PLA soldier uh, trying to organize something. So uh, ethnic minorities, uh, petitioners, these are all political, potential political troublemakers. So altogether, my estimate is the target population is about 10 to 12 million, 30 million people. So, uh, less than one percent, but sort of a. So this is so sort of, uh, the system is really good at sort of identifying and then watching known targets. Okay, so we are almost almost done. So high tech, the piece that has received most attention. It's a relatively new development. Until about ten years ago, China did not have that system. But ten before so before the system was built and became fully functional, China already had a very effective surveillance system. So, uh, so, there were, uh, so these are the components. If you sort of go down the list, you say, the, the Chinese Communist Party actually knows what it, what it is doing. It has used technology in a very smart way. The first thing it did was to develop a digital database to get all the information. So that is called Golden Shield. Uh, project uh, conceived in the late uh, 1990s, and it took them uh, roughly some eight years to build. Uh, for our interest, the Great Firewall of China is part of this system. Okay, it's not, it's not, uh, 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 so after this, the police has secure uh, communication, capacity to, uh, to control the internet, and also, to build individual databases, applications for very specific purposes. For example, it is this system that contains a national database of key individuals. Even though, I believe, designation is done by local authorities, but once you are designated, if I am a key individual, then the system connects, so the information gets trans transmitted to the central database. So what this does is that if I leave Cambridge this afternoon and appeared in LAX in the evening, the moment I turn on my phone, the LA police would know that I am there because the system is uh, fully automated in, in that sense. So it's a very powerful system. And the second step in this system is the sort of uh, first visual uh, uh, surveillance, the camera, they call it Skynet, uh, focused initially on urban areas. And the initial technology was not primitive, but was less advanced uh, and quite re uh, restricted. Uh, an interesting thing about this system, it uses a lot of smart sensors. So what are the smart sensors? Uh, uh, mostly devices that track mobile phones. Uh, so Wi-Fi sniffers, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and the third step, because this system was built to monitor cities, so what would they do? Then in the, uh, about 10 years ago, they began to expand the system to the countryside. It's called Sharp Eyes. This system was run by the Ministry of Public Security. It's a police-run system, much more secure, 
uh, than this one. This is run by local party uh, political legal committees, so much less secure. What this system, uh, this system has several components. One is a significant technological upgrade, uh, because when this system was built, there was no facial recognition. A lot of sensors were quite primitive. So this system upgraded the Skynet. Now, sort of social credit system is, again, I call this an aspirational uh, program. It has received a lot of attention, but when you look at local data, look at uh, the Chinese articles on this, it's very challenging. What I'm struck is that Chinese local authorities love this system, because why? They have an extra tool for social control. The, uh, this system is used today much less for political purposes than for uh, discouraging people from certain behavior. Uh, in Beijing, uh, if you park your electric bike in a public building and uh, the battery catches fire, then you lose social credits. So that's so that kind. Of, uh, but I think over in the long run, if you do not have a national sort of standard national uh, well, uh, set of, uh, sort of criteria for coding, then the information you get from this time probably is junk. Because uh, uh, there's somebody who spit, which actually can lead to sort of some uh, loss in your sort of credit score, is a political threat. So, uh, so I have a lot of doubts about this. So I think much more frightening is the grid management system. This is old Chinese history, so Baojia system, uh, so being brought back alive. They divide communities into grids, 300 households, and then they assign somebody, uh, uh, full-time person equipped with smartphones and is supposed to build each, so uh, there's a small grid, a medium-sized grid, a big grid. Uh, the goal is to use labor-intensive approach and technology-intensive approach to allow authorities to maintain real-time awareness of what's going on. So that is uh, uh, the sort of a, uh, the uh, the big uh, sort of a, uh, now the big picture. Why is that? If you look at the components that will make a surveillance state really effective, China had those only in the last twenty years, uh, and then. Uh, uh, Surveillance, effective surveillance state requires two pieces, both labor intensive and uh, advanced technology. Uh, and another thing for us uh, political scientists is that uh, there is always this puzzle about sort of regime longevity. One party dictatorships tend to survive much longer. And so the surveillance, this sort of look at one big piece of preventive uh, repression is that one party systems probably does a better job than other regimes in sort of maintaining surveillance. And the last piece is of how come China's rapid economic development has not led to a loosening of political control or bottom-up liberalization. Uh, the explanation is here is uh, not the only explanation, but one explanation is that uh, there is a race between surveillance capabilities and uh, bottom-up liberalization. So if a regime can use the resources to strengthen its surveillance capabilities, probably that regime uh, has better odds in keeping itself in power. OK, so. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pei. Uh, uh, I just uh, want to say, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Um, I also just want to remind everyone that we do require that you identify yourself uh, before asking your question. Um, I know given the nature of today's talk, some of you may not wish to do so in a public setting. Uh, if so, please uh, reserve your question for after uh, the recording is over. Chris Anstey, uh, Bloomberg News. Thank you very much for your presentation, Professor. Uh, I wonder uh, how you interpret uh, over the past year or so uh, the uh, many uh, senior officials who have been moved from posts yeah. in different areas. Uh, and if I could also ask you 
uh, about uh, the appearance of uh, a Weibo account uh, for uh, MSS. Yes, MSS. Uh, and what that uh, tells us about uh, its confidence in uh, you know, the economy, uh, what do you make of all of that? Okay. Thank you. I'm actually an opinion columnist for Bloomberg, so <laughs> I've written on these two uh, uh, issues. Uh, the first one, I think what we have uh, uh, written on this is that it's a black box. We really don't know what exactly uh, happened with respect to these individuals. But so you take a step back and look at how elites at that level are recruited. Uh, elites in China at that level are recruited mostly on the basis of personal ties. Uh, the top leadership, in this case Xi Jinping, obviously has to know the person well. Uh, and he has a problem. That is, after staying in power for 10 years, the younger people he wants to promote to the level of ministers are not the people he would know because they did not have time to interact with each other. So he would make mistakes. And I think we should see more such mistakes in the future, especially if he stays say, beyond 15 years. So that is uh, uh, my, my take. And uh, the other issue is that MSS has become a lot more visible. So how do you interpret that? Uh, uh, one is that uh, Xi Jinping has emphasized holistic security. So that might implicitly uh, give the MSS more mandate, more sort of, a, uh, you guys, you need to be more uh, active. The other issue is that the current MSS minister is Xi Jinping's, one of Xi Jinping's closest uh, uh, sort of allies or uh, protégés. And he obviously wants to make a difference. That is, uh, he wants to show that MSS is under new management. And uh, he is wading into areas his predecessors would stay out of foreign policy. MSS is not supposed to be saying anything on foreign policy, but we've seen some, some posts that would probably make the foreign minister not that happy. Okay. Related to the title of your presentation, the preventive yes. Uh, one thing they do uh, a lot is that uh, obviously they still have limited resources. So uh, uh, what they do is uh, around key anniversaries, they want to make sure that uh, people on their list would not engage in any disruptive activities. So they would go to their doors and knock. Make sure, so, so they would warn. So that is a pre preemption in action. The other is that the informants, because we uh, see references, of course, uh, these references are very brief, is that based on certain intelligence, we successfully uh, prevented petitions, prevented uh, protests. So these are the sort of the way information gets used. So that is sort of preventing some, something that was in the works from happening. They intercepted, for example, uh, petitioners uh, who were on their way to Beijing or who on, were on their way to provincial capitals. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Aaron Wasserman, postdoc at the Harvard Academy for International Area Studies. Um, could you talk a little bit more, please, about the origins of the political legal affairs okay. commission and yeah. whether you see, like, what do you attribute the kind of wisdom to establishing that to, and is it manifested more broadly? Yeah. In the uh, I, I may not have time, but I've, I've written what this chapter in the book. If you want to find out more, but initially it was in the 1950s, 56 appointed. They saw there should be this because the Communist Party tends to sort of have spe uh, special lists uh, in charge of a particular portfolio, and they asked Peng uh, uh, this guy, to be uh, sort of the head of this leading group. Uh, uh, they, the leading group did not become a committee because a commission, Zheng uh, Fawei Commission, is a big group. And in the 1980s, uh, the reformers saw this, uh, like Zhao Ziyang, saw that this group was uh, an obstacle uh, to having an independent legal system or the rule of law. So they abolished it. After 1989, this was the first thing the party brought back because the party wanted to strengthen social control and it needed a commission. So that was uh, sort of the Tsing Fa Wei. And then over time, uh, when you look at local data, you will see that the number of people in Tsing Fa Wei began to increase and it acquired more and more responsibilities. Uh, I think uh, in the second half of the Hu Jintao era, they set up the Central Stability Maintenance Office, and it's inside Tsing Fa Wei. So it's a very interesting story. I think there's a book that needs to be written just on Tsing Fa Wei alone. Um, I, uh, Jeff Williams, uh, I'm an alumnus of Harvard and an associate at the Fairbanks. I had a very simple question. Um, what's the incentive for, let's say, a cab driver to become an informant? Oh, yeah. Is it public service? Is, no. it, is yeah. there payment? Is it, well, what is the payment? We don't know, but the police certainly has one leverage over them, your driver's license, right? <laughs> Easy. If you don't want to uh, sort of spy, then you lose your job. So the, uh, the difference between the Chinese system and other authoritarian systems is that the Chinese Communist Party controls a lot of current opportunities and future opportunities. So like college students. College, I, uh, there is a chapter, or there's a section in the book that deals with surveillance on campuses. Every classroom, according to some uh, colleges, universities, has a designated informant. So why would a college student agree? Quite easy, because you get to be your, a party member, and that opens a lot of doors. Uh, and you can get preferential treatment when you apply for grad schools. So a lot of uh, sort of pragmatic uh, incentives and potential costs. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in the use of these surveillance systems in Chinese society. I'm especially interested in the question of the free trial policy that was announced in 2021. I know that there's just tremendous anxiety among the population yeah, yeah. Yeah. that they're going to be targeted for having three children, a lot of fear, because people know that the one child policy was enforced in a violent way, but they don't know exactly what happened. So surveys so there's very, very little interest among most people in having three kids who couldn't afford even one. Um, and online, there's just terrible agitation about this. So my question is, do you know anything, have you seen any evidence for use of these systems <coughs> to gauge social discontent about this policy or other social discontent? Uh, no. Uh, uh, I, uh, because uh, most of uh, the local yearbooks uh, were published uh, 2021, 2020, so more recent ones, this, is, this seems to be a more recent development. So they don't cover. And I actually did not look at the category Ji Hua Seng Yu. So if you want to actually go online, look at sort of local yearbooks and type in Ji Hua Seng Yu, I'm sure you're going to see huge, uh, a long list of local reports. So I don't know. Uh, I just want to capture that was uh, Professor Susan Greenhall.
ask you. Yes, I, I guessed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Eva from Asia Center. Uh, I'd like to ask you some question about like a uh, community party members, uh, the surveillance system. Because I was in, uh, I lived in Beijing from yeah. 2009 to 2019, and my student, they are the Communist Party member, and they told me that they they have to uh, uh, per uh, periodically to write in the report to the party include what I'm doing, what I'm saying there. Yeah. So I was wondering, do you have any information? This is accurate or maybe? But they are the people around me. Yeah. And they told me they have to write a report, especially they are the kind of a, uh, the company, you know, party uh, secretary. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would not be surprised because this is not sort of a, uh, my focus is how the party watches the people. So how the part, not about how the party watches itself. Uh, incidentally, it will be very difficult to do because I think the party does not want its own members to know that they are on the watch as well. But I'm not surprised in the sense that on the Xi Jinping, there is a lot more emphasis on um, on party activities, and it, it has become very formulaic. That is, how do you gauge party members uh, are actually sort of doing party stuff? So they have a lot more reports. So I'm sure now, if you're a party member, uh, you have to f uh, fill up more forms and do more reporting than before. But whether it contains real information, I don't know, maybe I'll say, well, today I've read Xi Jinping's so-and-so, and, -so, and I, it really inspired me. So, <laughs> so you see a lot of stuff like this. Um, I really appreciated your comment about tech enhancing but not replacing labor when it comes to you know, the implementation of these advanced technologies. I'm curious if you could give two examples, one that you see that implementation working really well and effectively, and another where you think that's good. Okay. Uh, because I, uh, uh, I, I have nothing against tech, okay? But I, uh, so from local yearbooks, you learn these things. A, the tax system is very expensive. People just think, oh, tax is re replacing labor. So that's, uh, and 85% 80 of Chinese domestic security spending is by local governments. And local governments in China are not exactly flush at the moment. So that's why I think uh, so going forward, it will be uh, tough. And the second part about the tax system is that they're very fragile. Uh, because we're talking about fiber, uh, network collecting with, sen uh, with uh, uh, servers. Uh, so it requires a lot of labor. Uh, two kinds of labor. One is so routine, uh, so specialized maintenance. If you have a, so uh, uh, some technical problems, they will come and solve. Police agencies don't have the capability. They actually have to so farm it out to a local telecom company. So in Wuhan alone, they have 2,000 a team of 2,000 people dedicated to maintaining Wuhan's Skynet. So that's a lot of people. And the other thing about these systems is that um, they require a lot of cleaning. Because facial, those cameras actually need to be cleaned. And China is a very dusty place. <laughs> so that is challenging, right? So you just go out and clean and the, sort of your uh, lens wipers. Uh, and that requires a lot of labor. So just think about some of these, uh, these issues. And finally, uh, the uh, reach of the tech is actually quite limited. That is, if cameras can only watch what people do in the public. A lot of the time we're indoors, right? They cannot have camera in every room. And uh, the other day I sort of tried my sort of low-tech solution, how to prevent my cell phone signals being picked up. So I put aluminum foil around my phone, and I called my phone and it does not ring. So I guess probably that is a very simple uh, solution. And I go, go on Amazon, there are Faraday bags. So if you put something in your Faraday bags, the phone signals are blocked. So I think so the, there are a lot of ways the tech piece can be defeated. Good. Uh, my name is David Groff, and 37 years ago I had a postdoc here. 
Um, I have worked in China for about 15 years, in Beijing and in Shenzhen. And I wonder if you could comment about surveillance over foreigners. Um, oh, yes. I, have, I worked for the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games. Yes. And I was surprised how much information they found out about me and my family oh, yes. in the security <laughs> check. And also, when I was leaving China two years ago, I was somewhat frightened because I was pulled from the line. Yeah. And uh, they looked through their computers for about 15 minutes before I left. And yeah. thank God nothing was problematic. Could you please comment? Yeah, uh, in uh, the sections in local yearbooks, uh, foreigners, they maintain files on foreigners. Uh, foreign students, foreign academics, foreign business people, uh, not many references, but according to this uh, uh, sort of MSS official or Anquan Ting Anquan Ju, this person in Chu Fu, is that we have file on every foreigner. So that uh, we don't have a lot, okay, but uh, I'm, I'm not surprised they know a lot about you. <laughs> um, I, I think they know a lot about me too. Yeah. So I think uh, we have time for one last question from, uh, uh, with apologies, I saw there were many other hands, so. Oh, uh, no. Hi, my name is Rayhan said I'm a humanist lawyer for Uyghur Heritage. So your point about uh, the key people actually so it's like foreign nationals but as well as ethnic minorities piqued my interest and in, I mean I think these are the issues that I've been dealing with. Um, but you said like you know and I think this is the point that it's very much manifested in terms of its China's surveillance in the international arena. The fact that we know the surveillance state exists, there are spies and that work, that has a lot of deterrent effects. And we see that in the diaspora as well, like, you know, the fact that whenever, like, you know, I come to universities to speak, I know that students are very much worried that being seen or being surveilled, um, and it's very difficult to have that kind of discussion with the Chinese students who are concerned about their fellow citizens. But what, for me, like, what, and I have my own theory, but I'd love to hear your opinion, there's no shortage of criticism when it comes to China. You know, especially coming from the West or you know overseas. Like, but recently there has been more um, reporting on how China's actually investing so much in surveilling overseas. Like, but what is why that they're so invested in this? Yeah. Well, I think first the uh, party's paranoia knows no bounds, right? So this is, and the party always wants to control. Uh, but I'm skeptical about sort of the claims, extravagant claims being made about transnational suppression, right? because we just don't, other than anecdotes, we don't have good evidence. Scholars have to rely on evidence. The challenge is that this kind of information is not disclosed in local yearbooks, in official sources. Either local governments have nothing to do with this. Uh, so uh, my position is that I'm sure the party has a interest in finding out, in suppressing sort of activities, potential dangerous activities outside uh, Chinese borders. Uh, but uh, if you want to make credible, credible claims, you need better sources. Uh, New York Times, however good the paper is, does not cut it. <laughs> All right, please join me in thanking Professor Pei. <laughs>